Hi, so we're just going to go with this. Hello and welcome. My name is Celeste Harrison. I'm here from National okay. Geographic to welcome you to today's okay. Explorer Classroom from inside the Rising Star Cave System. Uh, the Rising Star Cave System is run by Lee Berger's team. Lots of great paleoanthropologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, biological anthropologists doing really, really cool work. Um, a few years ago, that team made a huge new discovery. They discovered more than a thousand different fossil elements belonging to Homo naledi, which is a previously unknown early human relative. Since then, that team has discovered a whole bunch more chambers within this rising star cave system in South Africa and have found a bunch more fossils to this new species, including an almost complete skeleton. We're super excited to have them here with us today. We're even more glad to welcome all these classrooms on screen with me. We've got schools from Ontario and Nebraska and Georgia and Wisconsin and Alabama. I'm in DC at National Geographic headquarters. The team in the cave is in South Africa in a cave. It's a very exciting day here on Explorer Classroom. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Becco, to Becca Pesciuto, um to rock and roll and get you guys oriented with this cave system and their amazing work. Right. Hi, my name is Dr. Oh. Am I on? Okay, great. Hi, my name is Dr. Becca Pachotto, and I am an archaeologist on the Rising Star Homo Naledi team. And we are talking to you from 30 meters, so almost 100 feet underground, in the Rising Star cave system. And we're sorry we're a little bit late. Um, up on the surface, where we have absolutely no idea what's going on from down here, they've had a really big thunderstorm today. So it's sort of messed with our internet and our electricity and all of that. But I think we've got it fixed now. Um, and I am here with three of my colleagues holding the light. And you can't see her right now, but we'll get her in front of the camera in a minute, is National Geographic uh, Explorer Marina Elliott, uh, Dr. Marina Elliott. We have Dr. Karen Warren here and Matabella Sikoane. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and who's, who's one of our cave explorers. Um, and we are back underground. We started underground in 2013, and we, we haven't been underground for five years. Uh, but we come back periodically. Our first time underground was in 2013, where we made that crazy discovery of more than 1,500 fossils belonging to Homo naledi, which is a species of ancient human relative um, that's about 250,000 years old. Uh, and we're back here, and that's in that first chamber where we were first working, for, um, and we haven't worked in this chamber for a while. And we're trying to figure out, answer some more questions. We've had a chance to study the bones and learn about the cave system, and, and the more we learn, the more questions we have. So we're back in here trying to answer some more questions, like, are there, are there still more bones in this chamber? Are, there, are they as uh, dense as the... the deposit of bones as dense as it was all over the chamber or just in that one spot. And we're still wondering how they got here and what they were doing here in the first place. So I'm going to let my colleagues say a few words about what they're doing and, and what their role is in the project. So um, let's go to the first. All right. <clears throat> um, I hope my voice is loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, my name is Matabela Tsikwani. I'm part of the exploration team. Basically, what my role is for now is um, I'm, a, I'm a safety caver. And um, before all this started, we were running cables so that we can be able to talk to you guys out there. Um, if they find, basically what I do is if they find fossils here down in the cave, I would run from outside. It's not really run, safe. <laughs> but I would, I would like run from outside to get here with a bag and put uh, the fossils safe safely in the bags and we get them outside. So mostly I'm a safety caver. Matabella makes his job sound like he's mostly just a safety caver. Really, he's a <laughs> cave explorer. And when he's not busy running fossils for us, they're, they're doing lots of other cool stuff. Yes. What do you do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> OK, I was talking based on um, what I'm doing yeah, exactly. But um, generally what I do is, what we do is we are a team of, um, we were five, four now, uh, one left. <laughs> um, we go into caves or we go around in properties. We look for caves. If we find caves, we would explore them, go to um, see how far it goes, map it, document it. And there's a lot of cool things that we do. 
<laughs> and find fossils. And yeah. find fossils. Yes. Karen? Um, I'm Dr. Karen Warren. I am here as a trainee to be part of the uh, underground astronaut uh, excavation team. I've uh, only obviously been down in the cave for a few days now, but uh, a lot of fun and we've been, and we've been helping, well, I hope helping, setting up the grid and uh, mapping up uh, parts of the site and that sort of thing so that we can get started properly going forward. And now I'm in a strobe light situation, which is always a lot of fun. <laughs> it's always a party in the right? We'll sort it out. This is not common in the camp, just so you okay. know. There we go. There we go. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, more generally, I am a paleontologist. Um, I've been doing research in uh, human and uh, Neanderthal interactions and what a hybrid between humans and Neanderthals would look like like a baby between humans and Neanderthals. And, um, and I suppose going forward, I'm going to be much more involved in outreach and education of evolution. And last but not least, I'm Dr. Marina Elliott. I'm the lead excavator and the, the head of the excavations here at Rising Star. Like Becca, I was part of the original uh, crew that did the excavations in 2013. And I've stayed on uh, in South Africa for the last uh, four and a bit years. I'm originally from Canada, and I have also a PhD in uh, biological anthropology and archaeology. So now we should open it to questions, I think. We absolutely should. I think the first question that a lot of our classrooms is going to have is, what is your daily commute like? Would your team be able to talk about what it's like to actually get to where you're at right now? Sure, I think um, Karen should describe this because uh, <laughs> for her it's the most recent effort. The uh, most raw. <laughs> yes, so Karen. Um, we've got, um, it's pretty, as you know, uh, caving already is quite uh, an interesting and intricate sort of landscape to navigate. So it's quite different from the general open air sites that I think I'm used to as an archaeologist and paleontologist. Um, we start off our day in a, in a larger cave system, well, the larger part of the cave system where the command center is stationed. And then we make our way through a system of increasingly narrow passages to what is known as uh, the Superman crawl. And that involves sliding on your belly through a very narrow tunnel underground <laughs> um, until you're on the other side. On the other side, we gear up to do some climbing over what is known as the dragon's back which is a sort of a, a narrow little what hill almost that goes over and across to the top of what is known. Once we're at the top of the chute, we skedaddle across this once again narrow passage. And then we basically just sort of brace ourselves and slowly meander down um, a, a slit in the rocks. Um, some, of, some parts of that slit come out at you and say hello to your pockets and rip your pockets. And at that point, we reach the ladder, and then we're at the top of <laughs> this part of the antechamber, and then we come across this narrow little passage behind us, and then we're finally in the <laughs> antechamber. So all told, the, uh, <laughs> the route that the commute that we take on a daily basis at the moment is about 200 meters from the nearest outside entrance, and we're about 25 or 30 meters underground from the surface here. That's an amazing commute. Kids on screen, give me a wave if you think you're up for a Superman crawl in a dragon's bag. Is anybody out there brave enough? That's amazing. And let's go take a question from one of them. So let's go to uh, Mr. Smith's cla classroom in Ontario. Give us a big wave, Mr. Smith's classroom. Ooh, I'm going to turn your microphone on right now. Send somebody up to ask a question. Sheila, what's your question? Warren, Speak into um, the mic. What, what was it like, um, like first discovering like your first species down there? What was it like discovering this new species underground? That's a really good question. You know, it was really, really exciting. Um, Becca and I knew that, that these bones had been found because cavers like Matabella had discovered these, these bones that they weren't sure what they were. And so we were sent down to make sure that they were something that was interesting to paleoanthropologists. And when we got down here, we really realized that there was just 
a whole lot of bones down here. So that, that first month that we worked in 2013, we kept bringing up bone after bone after bone. And each time we came to the surface and talked to the senior scientists, we kept saying, you know, this is different. This is different. This is like something we've never seen. So it, it really was very exciting because it was pretty obvious very quickly that we were dealing with something that nobody had ever seen before. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Amazing. I'm seeing a lot of really great questions coming in in the chat bar. Keep those coming. We're going to get to those in just a second for all of our live viewers. That's the chat bar just to the side of the video. Um, but let's go to another school in Ontario. Let's go to Miss McLaughlin's class. I'm going to turn your microphone on now. Come on up and ask a question, Miss McLaughlin's class. Hi, that. Big voice. Show it. Um, how did they decide to how to name the the species. species. Awesome question. Um, I guess I'll take that again. Um, so uh, Homo naledi, so you are in the same sort of bigger family group as Homo naledi, meaning Homo. We are all Homo sapiens. So that recognition was because this new species looks an awful lot like us. We know that they walked on two feet. We knew that they had hands that moved very similarly to ours much of their, their anatomy, like their teeth and stuff, look very much like humans. So we put them in the same bigger family group as us. But then there's a whole bunch of little parts of them that look very, very, very different. So for example, Homo naledi as a species had a very small head that's very different from, from the way all modern humans look. And there's some funny bits of their teeth that look really different. There's some parts of their arms that look really different. So we knew that they weren't the same species as ours, as us, but because they were in the same family group, we put them in that bigger group and gave them their own actual species name to, to make them, you know, a little bit more distinct from us. So it recognizes that they're, they're part of our bigger family group, but they're certainly not human. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's head to Sugar Creek Elementary for our next question. I'm going to turn your microphone on. Go ahead and send somebody up and ask a question. Uh, how many of them did you find? And did you find more after you found the first one? And then were they all the same or were they all a little bit different? Yeah, these are great questions. Uh, so we have found at least 18 individuals uh, and they run the whole age from really tiny little babies to sort of young kids to kind of teenagers to adults and even older adults. Um, and after the first one that was found by some cavers, then we just started to find lots of bones and, and we could figure out how many there were partly by looking at um, when we had multiples of the same bones. So your femur is the top bone in your leg and your thigh and you have one right femur and all of us each have one right femur so when we came up and we found out that we had three right femurs we knew that we had to have three individuals and so that's sort of how we counted how many there were with look how many times we saw the same bone or the same teeth over and over again that is awesome what cool logic let's go to Ms. Smith's class in Burlington. I'm going to turn on your microphone. Send somebody up and ask a question. Have you ever been scared in a cave? What's about that? Um, I, like, we even forget that we are in the cave. <laughs> <laughs> that's how, that's how not scary the caves are. But when you start, when you start going in a cave, yes, it's a little bit scary, but eventually you get used to it. I think there's some great life lessons there. Let's head to our next classroom. Uh, Ms. Batch, you turn on your microphone. Hi, guys. Send somebody up with a question. Perfect. Hello. I'm LaCoria. We've been reading a book called Written in Bones, and we learned about a process called pedestaling to help protect the remains. What other precautions are taken to protect uh, discoveries? Oh, that's a great story. Uh, great question. Um, Karen, do you want to talk about what we do to protect the fossils? 
Um, I'm not sure. Okay, general. Or? Be general. Yeah, in general. Yeah, in general. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a lot of different techniques. Quite often, it depends on the kind of fossils or bones that you find. So, if they are, uh, if they're protected under the ground, under the ground, and you as an archaeologist have dug them up, you want to keep that same protection. So, we tend to keep them away from the bacteria that might eat them, especially if they have some bone in them which might still be eaten by bacteria or something like that, which will lead to decomposing, which as you know, breaks down uh, organic things like bone and flesh and skin and hair. And uh, in that case, sometimes they're put into specialized cases or very, uh, very good uh, dry conditions that help uh, protect that. Um, and in other cases, when the bones or the fossils have turned to rock, Sometimes they're hard enough and easily protected enough that they could actually just be left in um, a general cupboard as long as they don't get scuff marks on them um, and are handled somewhat gently. So there are different things. It just generally depends on what they're made out of. And when we're underground and we're trying to get the fossils to above ground, um, we use pretty everyday things. Like we'll pick up a fossil and wrap it in bubble wrap. And then we put the bubble wrap fossil inside a Tupperware container. And then that'll protect it from getting smashed as we're climbing out of the cave. Oh, yeah, Montebello's got one of the Tupperware here. <laughs> Tupperware. Yeah, it's just a normal Tupperware. You put your snacks in or you put a fossil. It's sort of the same. <laughs> you don't want to eat the fossil, though. <laughs> I love the ingenuity. I want to give a big shout out to Canton, Michigan. They've got a bunch of classes tuning in. Send us your questions in that same chat bar that you're saying hello in. We can't wait to answer them. But let's swing back through St. Andrew's School. Um, let me turn on your microphone, Mr. Smith. You guys have another question? Yep. Right. You remember when you said that um, when the only when the thing when the bone thing that they only had one tail? Femur. Yeah, the yeah. femur. What happened if they had more than one bone that looked alike? How do you know that they didn't have two of the same bone but exactly like? Yeah, how do we know that it's okay to just assume they only had one right leg? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah? Well, okay. Like, yeah, sure. So we can tell from looking at different parts of their anatomy, different parts of their skeleton, whether they walked on two legs or four, and we could figure out pretty easily that they must have walked on two legs. And so if you only walk on two legs, then you only have one right leg. And so we just sort of, you can almost look at a, at a you can look at a modern human, look at any of us and, and use that to compare. Brilliant. All right, let's go back to Ms. McLaughlin's class in Grapeview. Um, did you guys find male and females, or did you just find like one gender? Oh, question. Um, well, we're not quite sure. It's a little bit hard to tell from these bones whether whether how many males and how many females we have. In some species, it's pretty easy to tell because the, there's something called sexual dimorphism, where the males are a lot bigger than the females. And uh, in Homo naledi, I think it's still a little more ambiguous, right, Marina? Yeah. Uh, so we're not really sure how many of the 18 or more individuals we found, how many of them are males and how many are females. But we're looking for more evidence so we can try to figure that out. It's one of our questions. Right. And let's go back to Sugar Creek. Do you guys have another question for us? Um, my question was, how many bugs or animals did you find in the cave? How many bugs? <laughs> how many bugs? <laughs> but, uh, other animals. We have, um, we have spiders down here. We have bats. Mm -hmm. We have, um, yes, we have a lot of things that are down there, but not a lot, a lot, like you would find outside. We don't have big animals. We got, just have these small things like the spiders and the bats. Did you and find snakes. a toad? A toad? <laughs> snakes, yeah. the occasional toad will yeah. hop in. Um, and there's porcupines up near the entrance to the cave, but not down here. Awesome. I remember in one hangout you did with us, 
you were telling us about how you can use those porcupine quills. Would you tell the classes about that again? <laughs> sure. Porcupine quills are one of my favorite tools for excavating. So we find them just up at the entrance. The porcupines drop their quills sometimes near the entrance. And we can just pick them up from the ground and, and use them. They're pointy. And so they're good for doing delicate work. And they're also kind of, they're, they're sharp, but they're soft. So they won't damage the fossils as we're digging. I love it. It's just so ingenuitive. Let's take our next class question from Ms. Smith's classroom. I'm going to turn on your microphone now. Okay. I really love it. I really love it. What do you eat when you're down there? Oh, Ella, what do you eat? What do you eat? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, normally, I don't bring food down in the cave, but we eat we eat whatever. If, if you, yes, if you if you have you brought meat, you can bring it down and have and eat. <laughs> if uh, Stephen does. Yeah. <laughs> You eat whatever you bring outside, but for now we have sweets. <laughs> yes, today is Halloween, so we have a little bit of candy down here for snacks. Oh, that's amazing. We've got a great question from Mr. Chris's class. They're wondering if this type of skeleton has been found in other places too, or if the area where Rising Star is is the only place that they used to live. So far, this is the only place we've found it, in Rising Star. Not, not just in this chamber of the cave. There's some other chambers where we're finding very similar fossils. But uh, so far, it's just this cave system. Awesome. So we're still looking. Another great question from online. We've got a school in Dallas, Texas, that wants to send a special hello to Dr. Becca. Yep. Um, and they're wondering how many of the underground astronauts can go into a cave and work at any given time. Uh, well, there's four of us in here right now, and we're sort of at our max. Um, you get any more than four people down here, and it's pretty busy. And usually we only have one person excavating at a time, but someone else is taking photos, and somebody else is doing the paperwork, doing documentation. Amazing. Thank you. Um, let's go back to Ms. Besha's classroom. Let's head back through Alabama. Do you guys have another question? Uh, yes. My name is Alex, and I was just wondering how much time it normally takes to fully excavate a fossil or an artifact. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> it depends on how deep the fossil is. Sometimes it can take a few minutes, sometimes it can take days. It depends on how deep it is. Yeah, we've worked on some this morning. We, we found a fossil as we were excavating. And, you know, in 15 minutes or so, we were able to pick it up. It was a small one. But there have been other times where we've excavated a fossil for several days. And we've realized that it's going to take a lot longer. So we've actually left and given ourselves a couple months to think about how to deal with it and then come back and worked on it for a couple more weeks before we've been able to get it out. So sometimes it can be a really long time. Awesome. All right. My cue now is going to be who has the most burning desire to ask their question. Give me a great big wave if your classroom has an awesome question. All right. <laughs> it looks like Mr. Smith's classroom is on it. Let's get your microphone on. Go for it. St. Yes. Andrews. So, like, uh, you said about being able to get, like, the, uh, the electricity. Where do you get it from, and, like, how do you transport it? Like, do you just bring it in packs and just use it up, or do cables go up to the surface, and, like, how? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So, yeah, in fact, we actually um, bring cables in from the surface, and we have what's called municipal power. So <laughs> now they can't see me at all. Oh, but, yeah, you can see the cord. Yeah, so you can see the cord here. So yeah, the, the cavers and the um, explorers brings, you know, meters and meters and meters of cables through the cave system to where we are now. And so it takes a lot of time and sometimes they're trying to put the cables where we don't have to actually move through them because sometimes the cave is so tight that there's not room for us and a lot of power cables. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we've run a lot of cables in here, but the cave also, the climate in the cave is a bit tough on the, on the power cords. So we usually have to change them once a season. 
What a cool question. Thank you guys so much. Um, let's go back to Wisconsin. I saw a lot of enthusiasm there as well. I'm turning on your microphone now. Go ahead and ask your question. How old are the fossils? Are they like millions of years old? They're really like a little bit. Or like, how old are they? Sure. So the very interesting thing about the fossils, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, I can correct you, they've been dated to between 250 and 350,000 years, which is um, in terms of our own human evolution that brought us our own species, that's the time period we're seeing the earliest Homo sapiens um, in the world. So it's very likely that they were living at the dawn of our own evolution of our species. Yeah, and the, one of the really cool things is that it's because they're at the same time period, it is possible that a species like Homo naledi might have encountered early modern humans. So we don't really know that yet. We don't have any evidence for it, but they were on the greater landscape together at the same time. So, and sometimes it's kind of fun to think about what that interaction might have looked like. Amazing. All right, let's go back through Alabama. Ms. Bash, do you guys have another question? Can you repeat the question? What are some challenges you faced on site? Okay. Um, there's, there's lots of different challenges. In fact, one of the reasons that we were late uh, logging on today was that there was a huge thunderstorm um, outside on the surface. And so it actually was interfering with our power. And so that's something that is, is pretty problematic for us sometimes. Obviously, we rely on the power underground here. And so when the power gets cut off, either because we get a lightning strike or there's some other storm, then that really interrupts and, and interferes with our work. But um, some of the other challenges are, are things like snakes. We have snakes on the surface, so sometimes it's it's a little more difficult to get into the cave than other days when you have to wait for the wildlife to move on before you go in. Um, and then and then there's the challenge of the cave. Um, you can't really see it on all of us, but we're, we get pretty dirty. Um, and sometimes we get scratched up and bruised and bumped. But, um, you know, although that's, that's a bit difficult sometimes for our, our parents to tolerate, I think all of us <laughs> think that it's pretty cool for all the fossils that we get out. I think all the kids probably agree with you. Give them a big wave if you think they have the coolest job ever. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go back to Ms. Smith's classroom for another question. Have you ever got stuck in a cave before? <laughs> no, but if any of you have, have heard about Professor Lee Berger, <laughs> who is our principal investigator, he's the only one of the group that's been stuck before. And... Um, He's been stuck in, in a different part of the cave from where we're sitting now, but that little part of the cave is now known as Berger's Box, just to commemorate his struggle of about 40 <laughs> minutes being stuck in the cave. <laughs> oh, that sounds terrifying to be stuck in there. Uh, let's go back to Grapeview for another question. Ms. McLaughlin's class, I've got your mic on. Okay, big voice, honey. Oh, wait, do I ask? Yep, yeah, ask right directly, honey. Um, have any rocks ever fallen on you before? Ooh, ooh, Macabana. On Rick. <laughs> 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 <It's bad. laughs> I don't know if you would like me to say this, but it fell in, uh, it fell on one of um, the explorers. His name is Rick Hunter, one <laughs> of the original um, cavers that went down. We have two uh, original cavers that went down, that's Stephen Taga, Taka, and Rick Hunter. So Rick Hunter, a rock fell on him. It didn't, it didn't hurt it him didn't, very badly, yeah. but it was just, I think it surprised him more than anything else. The reason we wear the helmets. Yes, <laughs> helmets are very important. Amazing. Um, I'm gonna ask the last question. I'm always a little greedy with it, but I love to ask every team the same question. We got the future explorers of our world on screen with us and watching live in their classrooms. Um, what advice do you guys have for them? Karen, you're the most recent of our <laughs> recruits. What what did it take? Um, be good at motivational letters. No, <laughs> um, I think in general, I I think sometimes you just need to ask um, and put yourself out there and just 
grab opportunities that come along. Sometimes uh, calls for new astronauts come by and um, and you just happen to think, oh, well, it's not going to be me and just put yourself out there. Um, apply, ask and uh, do things for yourself and I think you'll get there. Um, another thing that helps is uh, do lots of push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> I love the variety of advice. This is amazing. I like to to encourage people for is just be curious and be brave. Um, you know, lots of things seem scary at first, but when you actually get into the situation, it's almost never as bad as it seems. And curiosity, you know, is is really. Um, I mean, for us, exploration is really about curiosity with a purpose and a, a scientific purpose. So. Um, just if you're curious about something, pursue it, read about it, find out about it. And then as Karen said, you know, ask people how you can get involved. And um, that's really all it takes. Amazing. We're so incredibly grateful for the time that Matafella, Karen, Becca, and Marina have all spent with us this morning. We love hosting sessions with you guys. You are just a, a light in the Explorer classroom world, uh, as are all of our classrooms. So if you took pictures today and you want to show us how you're using Explorer Classroom in your daily life, tweet us at Nat Geo Education, um, hashtag Explorer Classroom. Show us. We love to see that stuff. And be sure to like and subscribe so you never miss a video. And check out natgeoed.org. Uh, to check out our upcoming schedule and register your classroom for one of these awesome on-screen spaces. We think you're so great. Let's turn on all of the classroom's microphones so that we can all scream bye and thank you to these amazing world changers. <laughs>